first scripture reading this morning can be found on page 657 of your pew Bibles. It is chapter 42 of Isaiah. We're going to be doing the first nine verses. That's chapter 42 of Isaiah 1 through 9 on page 657. This is one of the servant songs from Isaiah. Let us read. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nation. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spreads out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it, and the spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness, I have taken you by the hand. You. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Amen. Anybody know who that's talking about? Excellent. Old stuff. Our next reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3. You can find it on page 881 in your Pew Bible. We'll be reading verses 13 to 17. The baptism of Jesus. Matthew 3, 13 to 17. Can you have it say amen? amen. Let's read. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness, then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. We will now have an anthem from our choir.
Amen. Well done. Well done. You guys are sounding great. Don't sweat the small stuff. How come when I say that, everybody grins? Like, yeah. Don't get bogged down by worrying over trivial, unimportant things. Don't sweat the small stuff, right? Good advice. That's what everybody tells you, right? I saw one thing that says, hey, don't sweat the small stuff, and it's all small stuff. But is that true? Is it all small stuff? I don't know. The world will tell you to think positively and ignore the minor and mundane, insignificant details of life. But at the same time, they'll also tell you the devil is in the details. Right? Hmm. The phrase, and this is the best part, the phrase the devil is in the details means he sneaks up on you in small ways and is behind the scenes wreaking havoc. But here's the best part, because the, the phrase the devil is in the details comes from this one. God is in the details. So as the world usually does, they flip everything that God says backwards. So the devil is in the details means beware of the small stuff, while the latter reminds us to be attentive and thoroughly focused on the seemingly insignificant so as not to miss God's handiwork. As usual, the world looks at things differently than God does. Starting off small is most often how God works. And we need to understand the principle of what's called small beginnings. It takes discernment on our part to know when the small stuff is actually significant and worthy of our full attention. So here we are in a brand new year right? What is it, the eighth? So we're a week in, and many people focus on dramatic New Year's resolutions. And they are fueled by the hope of immediate and significant personal changes in our lives. But the reality is that few smokers have actually quit because of a single moment of resolve. Few overweight people have become slim and healthy because of one desperate moment of commitment. Few people deeply in debt have changed their financial lifestyles because they were resolved to do so as one year gave way to the next. And few relationships have been changed by the means of one resolution of good intent. Is change important? Yes. It is important for all of us in some way. Is commitment essential? Of course. In various ways, all our lives are shaped by the commitments we make. But growth in grace, which has the power of the gospel at its heart, simply does not rest its hope on big, dramatic declarations in moments of conviction or desire to change. It doesn't work that way. The fact of the matter is that the transforming work of God's grace is more of a mundane process than an impulse based in wishes and fly-by-night efforts, resolutions, and intentions. Personal heart and life change is always a process. And where does that process take place? It takes place where you and I live every day. And where do we live? Well, believe it or not, we all have the same address. Because our lives don't lurch from big moment to big moment. We live in the utterly ordinary, what they call the mundane, everyday existence. The truth is, most of us will never be written up in history books. I might, but I don't know. But um, most of us will only make three or four momentous decisions in our entire lives, like career choice, marriage, having children or not, travel destinations, et cetera. It's like you can literally boil it down to three or four really big decisions you've made. Everything else comes out of that. Several decades after we die, the people that we leave behind will struggle to remember things we did. You and I live in little moments of our daily existence. And if God doesn't rule our little small stuff moments, 
are small beginnings and we don't allow him to work to recreate us in the middle of them, then there's no hope for us. Because all that remains is the mundane. Ordinary rules. Legacy is obsolete. This is all there is. This is as good as it gets. The little moments of life, the small beginnings, are profoundly important precisely because they are the little moments that we live in and that form us. We could never be satisfied to accept that this is it. We couldn't. Because within our God-given human nature is this thing that yearns for more, for better, for change. And change often begins small. So what are small beginnings? Boy, I'm glad you asked that. Small beginnings often mean hard work, unglamorous tasks, sometimes long hours, with little encouragement, because no one is there to see what you're doing and praise your hard work. In other words, it's being a pastor. No, just kidding. Um, but, yeah, I couldn't wait. But it is not unnoticed at all. In Hebrews 6.10, Paul tells us this. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers, as you still do. Considering all things start off small, usually in seed form, if we take the biblical principle of Genesis 1, 11, and 12 in the context of creation, even human beings are formed from seed. We all start off small. The Bible encourages us not to despise these days of small beginnings. In the book of Zechariah, we read this. Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of this temple and he will complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of heaven's armies has sent me. Do not despise these small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. So now what this story is, is it's when they came back from the exile in Babylon and they began to rebuild the temple. Now, when Babylon destroyed the temple, that was Solomon's temple. And that was incredible. It was like one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was the most amazing building. They totally destroyed it and took them away to Babylon. So now they're coming back and Zerubbabel, or Zerubbabel, depending on how you pronounce it, he was the, in charge of the building project. Everybody looked at it and saw him starting to work and they're like, yeah, this is never gonna be like Solomon's temple. Why are you wasting your time? So he said this, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. That applies to us too. Don't despise the small beginnings because God rejoices to see the work begin in us. Amen? Consider a great oak tree. It's only a nut that died. Seriously, that's all it is. It started off small, but it became great, mighty, and big over time, right? It takes 20 years to grow a big tree. How many years does it take to mature wine? See what they pay for bottles of wine that have been around a long time? They've just been sitting in a cellar somewhere. How long does it take to establish a brand? How long does it take to get a reputation in business? How long did it take for me to be ready to answer God's call to be your pastor? 55 years, give or take? We should not despise humble beginnings. We should consider our ways and know that God sees and knows the outcome. And God is with us every step of the way in the small stuff, preparing us, growing us, maturing us, and manifesting his spirit in us. Businesses, ministries, families, or nations are not born in one day. You know that old expression, Rome wasn't built in a day. No, it wasn't. It was actually hundreds of years. So when a large empire, family, ministry, business, corporation, or nation springs up, it does not start out that way. And it's no such thing as an overnight success. People say, oh, you just popped up overnight. No. No, because that's not possible. It doesn't work that way, especially in God's kingdom. You know why? Because if we got successful that quickly, 
guess who we would give the credit to? Self-made man, right? Or woman. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You ever try to do that? I tried it. Hurt my back, but didn't get anywhere. Maturing and establishing anything of permanent and valuable substance takes time. We cannot fly before we can run. We cannot run before we can walk. We cannot walk before we can stand. And we cannot stand until we can crawl. And we cannot crawl until we have been born and separated from our mother's womb. It's a process. That's why they call them baby steps. This is where big drama Christianity gets us in trouble. It can cause us to devalue the significance of the little moments of life and the small change grace that meets us there. And because we devalue the little moments in which we live, we tend not to notice the sins that get exposed there, which means we fail to seek the grace that is offered to us. You see, the character of our lives is not set in two or three dramatic moments but in 10,000 little ones. The character formed in those little moments shapes how we respond to the big moments in life. And what makes all this character change possible? Relentless, transforming, little moment grace. Relentless, transforming, little moment grace. The little moment grace guides us and helps us, as David told us, in Psalm 37, the Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. In other versions, it says the steps of the righteous are ordered by God and they delight in his way. We can trust that God is working in our lives and we can see how everything fits together. It is during the time of small beginnings that God works on our character, which in time will show its strength in purpose. Humble beginnings are just that, humble. And the definition of humble or humility that I appreciate most is to be teachable. If you are humble, you are teachable. That means that you can learn. Because I don't know anyone who knows everything. I used to think I did, but I was wrong. That's not the point, though. In the small beginnings, in the humble starting points, we are still teachable. At this stage, we have not yet had the experience, and we are not viewing ourselves as being more experienced or better than anyone else. Unfortunately, that usually comes later. It's why the scripture tells us in the book of James, therefore, he said, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Peter also says in his first letter, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And how do we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God? By not despising small beginnings, by living out the grace of all the little moments, that he may exalt you in due time. God cannot work with us if we have too much pride in ourselves, if we have pride in what we can do and accomplish. We need to give him the glory for all we have and all we can do. That is why they are called gifts, because we receive them from the hand of God. The oldest book in the entire Bible, in case you guys didn't know, is the book of Job. It's the oldest book in the entire Bible. And in Job, we read this. But if you pray to God and seek the favor of the Almighty, and if you are pure and live with integrity, he will surely rise up and restore your happy home. And though you started with little, you will end with much. So how can I move this from preachy lingo to a meaningful and relatable explanation? 
All I can think of is to give a personal testimony. Let me share some small stuff moments that were God's grace and needed my full attention versus small stuff that I chose to sweat, which was a waste of my time and energy. Before I became a Christian at 26 years old, I sweated just about everything. I tried to matter in life. I wanted to be important. I wanted to get approval from my parents. I wanted approval from my peers. I wanted to impress my girlfriends. That was all I focused on. That's it. I thought I was the captain of my own ship. I reacted harshly, angrily, or violently to anyone who challenged me, who showed me disrespect in any perceived way, or wouldn't give me what I wanted or do what I demanded. What an exhausting way to live that was. Godless, basically. It was totally selfish and anything but humble. Yet there were moments I knew God was calling to me. Small stuff I chose to ignore then. A vision or dream of me standing at a podium addressing a crowd of people. Nah, that's not me. A weirdo classmate who loved religion class and seemed to have a happiness within him that I never felt. And though... I couldn't be his friend because that wasn't cool. I always somehow wanted to be around him. I always wanted to be a biologist. My mother thought I should become a lawyer. My father thought I should have been a glazier and kept installing auto glass with him because I had talent for that. Out of the blue, someone told me that I would be a preacher one day. I thought they were nuts. I don't want to tell you what I said to him because I'll offend everybody. But it spoke, but something happened. It spoke to me in here. And there were many such moments that turned my head like that, yet I managed to ignore them and keep doing me until I had messed up my life completely and found myself in a desperate disaster. Had I had the wisdom to pay attention to those small stuff moments, perhaps I could have saved myself and others a world of grief. God's grace was always there. You've heard the expression, hindsight is twenty twenty. I can look back now and see how God took me to places he needed me to be in order that I could be humbled and ready to pay attention to his still small voice. Becoming a Christian was a major changing point, but it was certainly not a dramatic moment of New Year's resolution. It has taken God many years to mold me and prepare me. And while I got, I still got in the way with my ego and my resistant pride, yet here I am. Now, I have not arrived by any means. I'm still a work in progress, like we all will be until we enter eternity. I try hard now not to sweat the small stuff, like which hymn to sing, or if my sermon is 16 or 18 minutes or whatever, or someone in front of me is driving too slowly, or what Lauren's making for dinner. The truth is, the singing matters more than the song because we're offering praise, right? The message itself trumps the time it takes to deliver it. The slow driver is probably God preventing me from being somewhere at the wrong time or teaching me patience or wanting to increase my prayer time over my cursing time. And whatever Lauren cooks is good. So I'm blessed to be provided with a meal. Amen? Small stuff. The small stuff I don't want to ignore are those moments in my spirit when I feel directed by God to smile at someone, to make a phone call, to give something, to do something, because those are God's grace speaking growth, maturity, transformational change into my spirit. Those are where God develops love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in me, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We read in Matthew today about Jesus' baptism. When Jesus showed up to John, what did John do? He said, I need you to baptize me. I can't baptize you. Because John was sweating the small stuff. Jesus said, no, no, no. Uh -uh. This is the right thing to do. Let's do it. It all starts with very valuable and important small stuff that with God's grace prepares me to be his servant and useful tool in this mundane life of little moments. That is what we are called to be, God's tools that cultivate the growth of love in small stuff moments that matter big.
God in us, Jesus, our Emmanuel. Hopefully, that is a tangible understanding that provides you godly discernment as to what small stuff to ignore and not sweat. Can you hope it up? A little bit? At least Jillian laughed. <laughs> I know it's not hard to make her laugh. So I'm, just give me a little grip. And more importantly, may we focus on the small stuff that God is putting on our path. Amen? Amen.